Emma Salmon, Research Associate at the Overseas Development Institute, and Stefan Berholst, Co-Founder and Chief Research and Development Officer of the GovLab at NYU. So, um, Sean, I'll invite you first to come and give your presentation. Thank you for having me. Uh, this, I'm Sean Higgins. I'm an assistant professor of finance at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. And this is joint work with Joshua Blumenstock at the School of Information at UC Berkeley, Laura Kyoda at the World Bank, and Paul Gertler at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. Uh, the project is on gender differentiated digital credit scoring using mobile phone data and machine learning. And the motivation for this project is that the, we know there are gender gaps in access to credit around the world. So among men and women with comparable credit worthiness, we've seen evidence from a number of countries that women face both a bias in the amount lenders are willing to provide, meaning that they get smaller loans, and they also face higher interest rates than comparable men. Now traditional credit scoring models uh, contribute to this bias in a couple of ways. First, they use data that may be biased against women. So the traditional inputs into these credit scoring models are often uh, biased against women in the sense that especially lower income women with limited credit histories tend to be less likely than men to have, say, formal labor earnings histories, legal ownership of joint assets, or a formal credit history, which are the inputs used in traditional credit scoring models. Uh, traditional credit scoring models also omit gender entirely or include it as a binary predictor variable. Excluding it entirely can actually hurt women, who it's intended to help by uh, excluding it. And, it can, and even when including it, the ways that traditional credit scoring models do this don't incorporate the ways that gender could interact with all the other predictor variables in the model in the sense that those predictors could differentially predict credit worthiness for men and women. Now, big data and machine learning can help solve this problem. Uh, big data provides us new and rich data to predict credit worthiness. Uh, for example, mobile phone call detail records, which are being used increasingly around the world to predict credit worthiness, have a number of potential benefits. They're nearly universal in places where nearly everyone has at least a feature cell phone. Uh, they provide high frequency data. They give us information about communication patterns, geographic mobility, and social networks. And they've been shown in uh, other research to be good at predicting credit worthiness. Machine learning can provide us better predictive power than traditional models, but it can also exacerbate this bias, potentially. So the innovation that we're going to test in this paper is to gender differentiate each stage of the model's process, which includes first the feature selection, the hyperparameter tuning, and the model estimation, or the coefficients that we're assigning to each variable that ends up getting included in the model. So just to give you a sense of what the data look like, here are uh, call detail records data from another project of Josh Blumenstock's in Afghanistan. And you can already get a sense. Each of these kind of lines and dots in the graph is a call being made. And you can get a sense of how these would give you a rich uh, sense of various uh, behavioral patterns uh, that individuals exhibit. So let me move to telling you what we're doing in this project. You can think about two types of models, a gender differentiated model and a pooled model, where we're using the same machine learning techniques, and we're even giving the model gender as one of the variables it can use, and it can interact it with everything else however it wants. But what we're finding is that it's not still not kind of thinking about all the potential ways that different predictors in the model could predict credit worthiness. So here I'm showing you on a, on a scatter plot, the, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the uh, probability of repayment that women get from the gender differentiated model. And on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the probability of repayment that they get assigned from the pooled model, where the model is estimated on data from both men and women. And what you can see here, the 45 degree line is then going to tell you uh, that women would be getting the same predicted probability of repayment or credit score in each model. And what we're seeing here is that 93% of women are above that 45 degree line, meaning that even though we gave uh, gender to the pooled model, the uh, gender differentiated model is assigning higher credit scores to women because it's taking into account the different ways that all of these features of the call detail records data can predict uh, credit worthiness differentially for women.
Now we're still working on the machine learning uh, phase of this project, but I also wanted to quickly talk about our second phase, which is going to be that now you can think about the kind of cutoffs for credit worthiness in the models, and that's going to create four quadrants. One of those quadrants is going to be women who would be eligible for the uh, for credit using the gender differentiated model, but ineligible using more frequently used pooled models. And so the second phase of this project is to do an RCT, a randomized control trial, where among new applicants in that quadrant, we're partnering with a bank, and among new applicants for credit, we're going to randomly assign which model is used to predict their credit worthiness, which is in essence randomly assigning whether they get credit because they're in that quadrant. And so that's going to allow us to measure through surveys what's the impact of credit for this population who wouldn't have been eligible for credit using traditional pooled credit scoring models but would be eligible under the pooled model. We're just starting to apply for uh, funding for that stage of the project now. So if there are any funders in the audience who are interested in working with us, uh, please come talk to me afterwards. And I'd also like to thank the funders for this initial stage of building the model, which include Data2x, uh, the Digital Credit Observatory, which is funded by the Gates Foundation, USAID, and the World Bank. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. So Emma, I'd like to invite you to give your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today and very grateful to Data2x and to the GovLab for the invitation. And I'm going to be presenting findings on behalf of collaborators at Overseas Development Institute, Data Pop Alliance, and Ulula. And these findings are one component of a larger project on uh, women and the gig economy, which is funded by Data2x and the Gates Foundation. So my focus today is on the impacts of engaging in gig work uh, for domestic workers in South Africa. And what I'd like to do, sorry, let me just say that by gig work, we mean jobs that are obtained through Uber-like digital platforms that connect uh, workers to purchasers of their services. And so I will first give an outline of our motivations and objectives in undertaking this work, then the methodology we use, and then highlight a few key of the key findings. So in this work, we sought to uh, address two of the gaps that we identified in the literature on the gig economy. The first gap is that much of the evidence on working conditions is focused on high-income countries, notably the United States and Europe, where the gig economy has been identified as providing poor quality working conditions uh, and rollbacks in worker rights and protections. But there's little analysis that's focused on its impact in lower income settings where there are high levels of informality. And in other words, the starting point is quite different. Secondly, there's very little research to date which is focused on gendered experience of gig work. And this despite platform claims that it's flexible and ad hoc nature, namely the ability to let women, uh, excuse me, to let workers choose their preferred times for work and to some extent its location can support women in particular to balance paid and unpaid work. So in this research, we sought to interrogate both of these assumptions. In terms of method, we employed three main methods of data collection. First of all, we connect, collected sociodemographic and perceptions data from around 650 domestic gig workers, which constituted some 40% of those registered on a domestic work platform in South Africa. And we conducted a nine-round automated voice response survey uh, administered in collaboration with the survey company Ulula. Secondly, our digital platform collaborator provided us with data on their workforce, which we were able to merge with the survey data at an individual level to, to obtain a fuller profile of worker experiences. And then we separately analyzed the data to obtain a more comprehensive picture of job supply for the workers that were registered on the platform, as well as worker availability, utilization, and earnings. And then thirdly, we carried out in-depth interviews and focus groups with gig workers uh, who were caring for at least one young child. And that was to understand better the trade-offs between gig work and family life. And we interviewed key informants from the private sector, from government, and from civil society organizations. So overall, in first let me give a profile, given that there has been relatively little work that is uh, sought to develop a picture of who gig workers are. 
The profile of gig workers was very, in South Africa, was very similar to those who are working in the traditional domestic work sector. Uh, they were overwhelmingly black African women, and many were migrants, either from rural areas of the country or from adjoining countries. One difference is that the median age of, of gig workers was 35 years old, which is somewhat younger than the median for traditional domestic workers. Another difference was that around one quarter of the domestic gig workers were studying alongside uh, undertaking domestic work. <laughs> and the chief motivation for domestic workers to engage in gig work in South Africa appears to be economic necessity. Nonetheless, the workers reported that gig work presented some incremental improvements over traditional forms of employment in terms of the ease of finding work, in terms of having more control over when they worked, higher hourly earnings, and some other factors like having the company available to act as an intermediary with their clients when, when that was needed. Overall, around two-thirds of our survey respondents felt that the platform gave them more choices for work than they would have elsewhere, while fully 91% reported that gig work gave them greater freedom and control in their work. There were also drawbacks that, that emerged, notably the lack of any guaranteed work, threats to safety occasioned by the need to travel between short gigs and uh, in a context that's characterized by high crime, and the fact that they were working in multiple different households and the lack of entitlement to public uh, social protection, which could make routine uh, life events such as childbirth profoundly difficult for many women. Though at the same time, it should be noted that only around one third of traditional do domestic workers who were entitled to domestic, uh, excuse me, to uh, social protection coverage were actually obtaining this in practice. So given time limitations, I'm going to focus on two aspects of work, on earnings and on flexibility, uh, then briefly comment on overall platform operations and the implications for marginalized women workers. So on earnings, our analysis demonstrates that as of late 2018, the average weekly earnings were around 900 rand, which is the equivalent of about $145 in purchasing power parity which is around 50% higher than the government mandated minimum wage for domestic workers in the traditional sector, though as you can see in the graph there with, with considerable seasonal variation. Hourly rates, in other words, are considerably higher for gig workers, while utilization rates for full-time workers, which we defined as those that were available for work five or more days weekly, averaged around 60% over a one-year period. So workers were able to get work for about 60% of uh, an average week. But while domestic gig workers earn more than they would in traditional settings, these levels nonetheless uh, fall short of a living wage for a family of four. And we took the lowest estimate of um, a living wage, which you can see in the yellow line on the chart. So this is particularly concerning given that, that most of our survey respondents, 84%, reported being the person who contributed the most to their household income, while nearly all had financial dependents. And moreover, the irregularity in receiving bookings meant that some gig workers experienced significant changes in their incomes from week on week. And you can see that in the gray line on a chart, which looks at average variation from mean earnings. And the average was close to 50% weekly over a 16-month period. Another area we looked at was the flexibility to manage paid and unpaid work. And here we find that, that the platforms offer some flexibility for childcare and for educational pursuits, among other activities. At the same time, this flexibility was limited in practice by client demand, which determines the volume, the location, and the timing of bookings. So women gig workers, the majority of whom were single mothers, relied primarily on relatives, on neighbors, and friends to provide childcare. But when such support was lacking, they also employed some high-risk strategies, such as leaving young children alone or in the care of slightly older children. Overall, one-third of our survey respondents reported that they had uh, left a young child uh, either alone or in the care of another child 10 years or younger in the for at least an hour in the previous week, and this, with the share varying sizably, as you can see in the chart here, depending on the other options that were available to them for child care. A key finding is that we don't see any evidence that flexibility per se is associated with higher levels of worker satisfaction. And in this, our results contrast with other work, namely work on Uber drivers in high-income countries, which has found that they report higher levels of life satisfaction than other similar workers, in part due to a preference for the flexibility that the platform offers. 
Amongst our workers, in contrast, hours of work was one of the most important predictors of life satisfaction. So one strand of research in literature on the gig economy has addressed the extent to which platforms are characterized by a superstar effect in which a small share of workers take on the majority of available work. I think there's a study of Me Mechanical Turk which shows that um, I think 10% of workers are taking on something like 75% of the available tasks. Uh, versus a long tail effect in which work opportunities are more equally distributed. On our platform, we found greater evidence of a long tail effect than has been identified elsewhere, but nonetheless, some workers fared better than others. We found that the top percent, the top 10 percent of full-time workers, those who did the most work, were taking on around one quarter of the available hours of work that were carried out by full-time workers. And the success of those workers was linked to positive ratings, to the length of time that they'd been on the platform, and critically, to being relatively more available to taking up gigs. So this flexibility element comes in again. And finally, although our weekly data only span a period of 16 months, they suggest that the available gigs may have become more unequally distributed across workers during this time. What we have there is a simple Gini coefficient in the chart to the right which seems intuitive given that some workers have an opportunity to acquire more experience than others, and those with higher ratings are perhaps more likely to focus on the income generating opportunities that the platform offers. But this highlights the need to focus on what supports might be needed to, to foster the engagement of uh, people who are starting out on the platform and women who may be at risk of becoming marginalized on the platform as it continues its operations. So on the basis of this research, we argue that policymakers and platform companies jointly have a responsibility to improve economic security, to support childcare, to give workers more control over their schedules, and to take measures to improve worker safety. The governments also ought to put in place regulations to ensure that platform companies are providing a minimum set of protections to their workforce in line with the relevant national legislation on labor rights. So I've given just a very brief snapshot of some selected findings, but for fuller information, would encourage you to look at our full report on women in the gig economy, which is focused on Kenya and on South Africa, and will be released tomorrow. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. And uh, last but not least, Stefan. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to... Um, thanks very much. I'm Stefan Verhulst. I'm the uh, co-founder of GovLab, and I'm delighted to be here and delighted to work, as always, with uh, Data2x on uh, furthering the, uh, the movement towards uh, uh, gender-sensitive data systems. And what I would like to talk about here is uh, a project that we've done with support from Data2x in order to analyze gender mobility uh, using cell phone data, CDRs, call detail records, uh, in Santiago de Chile. And uh, we started with uh, uh, a few questions. And the first and the most important question, I guess, that we tried to uh, answer was, um, are cities gender neutral? And more specifically, um, is m urban mobility uh, gendered or is it uh, also gender neutral? And I think uh, uh, what we really tried to figure out was if there is a certain notion of gender, i.e. if cities are gendered, to what extent does this also translate in actually urban mobility planning? Uh, because the assumption here is that urban mobility planning assumes that actually urban mobility is not gendered, that uh, uh, men and women travel around in the same way, have the same kinds of needs, have the same kinds of challenges, and as a result can be addressed by a single approach uh, that quite often is informed by a particular kind of gender. And so that was the starting question. And uh, we also try to in look into a, a whole range of problems, such as indeed to what extent is gender sensitive, uh, uh, is, is transportation design gender sensitive? To what extent is there actually gender disaggregated data that can inform urban mobility, and also how can we come up with a solution that doesn't always rely on surveys? Because a, a big challenge, of course, uh, in doing this kind of research, especially uh, as relates to urban mobility and as it relates to understanding gendered um, 
gender disaggregation is that quite often you always rely on surveys and as we know, A, there are design challenges here with regard to really capturing real behavior and two, uh, they tend to be also quite expensive. And so for those that cannot afford, are there other ways of actually leveraging data that can be gender disaggregated that can inform the question with regard to urban mobility, especially given the fact that urban mobility, of course, is a predicate for economic mobility. I, if, urban, if urban mobility is different, then that likely explains differences with regard to economic mobility. And so we uh, saw opportunities in the big data space, and so we teamed up uh, with um, Telefonica in uh, Chile, and we also teamed up with um, um, a satellite uh, operator, um, Digital Globe that uh, provides us access to uh, granular satellite data. And we also, of course, uh, were delighted to be part of the Data2x uh, challenge. And so what we did was build a data collaborative. Me at GovLab, uh, for the last few years, we have tried to pioneer the concept of data collaboratives because the key lesson here is that in order to really further insight and then subsequently action upon the insight, this quite often needs to be done by a new kind of public-private partnership or a new kind of partnership. And so here we built this or designed this new kind of data collaborative where on the one hand we had UNICEF as one of the problem owners together with Data2x of course. We had GovLab who was leading the, um, uh, the collaborative and then we had on the other hand the data providers Telefonica Digital Globe and then we had scientists that could uh, leverage the data in order to generate insight and that then also could lead to action that was informed by the uh, insight. And so what I'm going to share is very briefly what we've learned and also some insights with regard to data. So what we did was we analyzed 416,000 uh, CDRs. Uh, we also commingled that with other data sets because I think as we probably have learned throughout the day is that in order to really generate insight with regard to gender, you do have to start commingling different uh, data sets. And so we uh, connected it with data that was provided by the Public Transportation uh, Office in Santiago. We also used OpenStreetMaps. And of course, we also had demographics from the 2017 census, which is a very decent census, which is another reason why we wanted to do it in Santiago de Chile, so that we then actually could use the same model in other places places where you might not have access to census. So he, because here we could actually do some ground truthing that could actually be uh, repurposed in other uh, environments where there is no uh, real census availability. Here, how we managed to identify um, and came to uh, come to the 416,000 was basically, anyway, the criteria that we used to select who was included in the universe of uh, analysis. So what are uh, some of the key findings very uh, briefly, realizing that I only have uh, 10 minutes and who knows how many minutes left, <laughs> five minutes left. Um, well, the first, um, and I think the, um, um, the big, uh, of course, confirmation here was that indeed uh, urban mobility is gendered, i.e. women and men do travel around differently. And the question is, of course, how different and in what characteristics uh, can we uh, notice that? And the first uh, big uh, insight was that women and girls have lower mobility, i.e. they visit fewer uh, unique locations than men. Um, and they tend to be more localized. So they, they tend to stay within their neighborhood and they go to a few uh, fewer unique locations, uh, uh, which quite often means that they go to the same locations on a more regular basis, right? So that was a first uh, key insight with regard to the urban mobility aspect. Uh, they distribute their trips among a few, as I mentioned, highly preferred locations. So the locations that they went to more often than men happened to be taxi stops and hospitals. And so a clear insight with regard to, uh, uh, again, differences in actually the needs that uh, women might have with regard to transportation and also the locations where they tend to go more than men. And then more importantly, of course, is that if you compare that with some socio-demographics, then we see that actually poorer women travel less. 
Uh, so gender inequalities in mobility grow wider as socioeconomic status uh, worsens. And we can see that, anyway, across Santiago de Chile, that actually the difference between men and women level out in more affluent uh, regions, but it's really the poorer regions where the men travel more or have better uh, uh, urban mobility than the women uh, to a large extent. So that's the typical situation analysis. And so what we try to do is then also do some cause and effect analysis. Are you trying to explain uh, um, what is the reason of this? And uh, what we try to do, uh, so this is another graph, what we try to do was to actually go and, and um, explore to what extent is availability of transportation, public transportation, a key indicator or variable that explains the um, mobility differences. And so we uh, looked at uh, availability of public transportation, <coughs> sorry, and came to the realization that um, uh, availability actually does not make uh, much of a difference, which is uh, one of those, sorry, I'm going to have to drink something because I'm recovering from a cold, not a carrot, as they would say, <laughs> that um, um, uh, might limit my final findings here. And so um, <coughs> availability of public transportation does not uh, improve women's mobility. It turns out it does improve men's mobility. So if you have access to public transportation, men become more mobile. But this uh, did not have a major impact on uh, women as such. And so I think it's very important to realize that indeed urban mobility and inequality go hand in hand. I just uh, reflected on that as you all have followed perhaps the, um, what is happening in Santiago de Chile as we speak, where actually there's a huge outbreak just because they wanted to raise the price of public transportation. That, of course, again, what would be interesting to see is to what extent has, has this actually a different kind of impact across gender uh, uh, groups as well. So <coughs> some recommendations, of course, anyway, it would be no recommendation if you uh, to do more research if I would not have been a researcher. So we need, to, of course, more pilots, especially we need to compare, compare that with other data sets, such as availability of childcare, safety, and other uh, transportation information. And we also need to scale up uh, data collaboratives, because it turns out that, indeed, this was not just an exercise in order to prove um, and, and find some insights with regard to gender differences, but it was also a proof of concept with regard to data collaboratives, and it proved, proved to be very valuable to have different kinds of expertise and different kinds of data assets uh, uh, availability. Other recommendation, uh, which I haven't put here, is to also really think end-to-end, -end, meaning, and that's something that we at GovLab are starting more and more working on, because too often we see those data collaboratives ending at the insight stage, right? So now we know that urban mobility is gendered, so what are we going to do about it, right? And so how do we move from data to insight and from insight to action? And so we've tried uh, uh, the action part by actually providing several briefings in Santiago de Chile, uh, but that have turned out this translation from insight into actually a more gender-sensitive transportation policy turned out to be harder than uh, um, anticipated. Next steps, what we have proposed is actually to replicate that study in different uh, areas where there is availability of call detail records. And so what we hope to establish is a uh, gender data for urban mobility hub, especially given the fact that urban mobility is so essential, as I mentioned, for economic mobility. It's really important to actually understand urban mobility and to what extent is that uh, gendered. And of course, one of the other uh, initiatives that we have started together with Data2x is the 100 questions initiative in order to really understand what are the questions that matter, because that's another key recommendation is that um, in order to really provide insight with regard to what matters for, uh, from a gender point of view, we actually have to spend much more time on formulating the questions that matter beyond just trying to tap into uh, data assets that might be made available. We also launched a new journal, which is uh, with Cambridge University Press, which is Data and Policy Journal. And so we hope to have a special issue with BAPU uh, uh, being on the editorial board. 
um, um, focused on gender and data as well. And so those that have an interest to be part of that, let me know and uh, uh, we will uh, include you in the review uh, and then ultimately in the publication. So with that, I want to thank uh, our partners. Of course, I was just the um, voice here, although it sounded a bit broken. And um, um, of course, we had many uh, colleagues here that couldn't be here from um, Torino, from Santiago, and from here, uh, UNICEF as well. And some of my GovLab colleagues are here in the room as well. With that. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so three very rich presentations. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we'll take two or three at the same time and uh, then turn it to the panelists. So questions. Okay, I see two over here and two here. Okay, so maybe we'll take these four if, if we can hold those in our minds. Um, I, my first question is for Sean. I wanted to ask, um, so essentially you're saying interaction effects were not being estimated in these pool models. Um, so I was kind of interested to know, so first like why? Uh, and why were interactions being dropped, essentially? And um, in the part where you actually use these segregate, separate models, stratified models, which features are the ones that actually seem to be working differently for men and women? If, maybe if you could sort of give an example or one or two. And Emma, I had a question for you, which was, to what extent do you think, coming back to the issue of who's selecting onto sort of gig economy platforms, coming back to this question of, do you think that these platforms are actually employing, helping people get employed who would be unemployed otherwise? Or is it just sort of, you know, the, those who are crafty and would be employed anyway, just, you know, are getting better on those platforms in terms of the money they can make? I think we had another question just here. Uh, thank you very much, all. It was very interesting. I have a question for Sean. So mm, can you, you said that when you, you had a pool uh, model and then two different models based on gender. So may I ask that how much the accuracy of model increased for, uh, after you did this uh, kind of two model approach? And also, what did you by any chance check it for what happens for men? Thank you. So Thank I think you. we had two questions over here. The one here and one here. We'll take this one first. Thank you. Um, my question is for um, Stefan, but I think has relevance more broadly. <clears throat> I'm a feminist geographer, so I know that in my discipline, we've known that gender, or that mobility rather, is gendered for decades. Um, Doreen Massey's been saying this since 1970. So my question is more on the part that I think is really interesting about these data collaboratives for bringing data to bear on policy making, on financing, et cetera. So is it that some of our traditional sources of data, like surveying and qualitative interviewing, where we're actually hearing from people that this is a problem or this is what my life is like, is not as compelling as big data? And what should we say or, or do about that? Hi, I'm Lucia. I'm here from JPAL. Um, so I was really heartened to hear some examples about how um, some of the administrative data in the various projects that you're conducting um, can potentially be used for experimental analysis, especially with Sean's example. Um, I want to also briefly mention that JPAL's launched an uh, initiative called IDEA, which is using um, administrative data and uh, conducting policy experiments. We'll be launching a handbook on best practices and using admin data, and then we'll also be um, looking at ways to uh, capitalize on some experiences that we've had and successes in having embedded staff that work in government ministries to kind of help bridge that gap between the data analysis to actually experimenting with policy implementation. Um, so I guess my question was for the three of you, um, uh, when thinking about using the data sets that you have access to for descriptive analysis versus for policy experimentation, what have been the challenges and differences in, th in those um, distinct conversations? Okay, great. Thank you so much for those great questions. So I think there was at least one for each of you and then one overarching question. So maybe we'll just move down the line. So Emma, if I can start with you. Uh, yes, so 
two questions I think are most relevant. The first about uh, self-selection onto platforms and are people, were people previously unemployed or are they working on platforms um, alongside other work? And I think we have some insights into that both from the survey data that, that we collected and from the qualitative interviews, less so from the platform itself because they did not collect data on what registered workers were doing previously. Um, so bear in mind in South Africa, uh, Unemployment among women is 30%, and um, I believe it's 55% amongst young people. So it's a context of very high unemployment. And something that emerged in the qualitative work that, that we did was that uh, many people that had registered on the platforms had previously been uh, unemployed. Uh, having said that, I believe around 50% of the workers were doing other work alongside gig work. And in two rounds of the survey, I mentioned we conducted the survey in nine rounds. In two rounds, we collected quite detailed time use uh, data, which uh, gave us insights both into the amount of paid and unpaid work that women were doing, but also into the amount of time they were spending working on the platform versus non-platform work. And so I mentioned about 50% had worked on the platform in the week that we asked that question. And um, I believe that amongst those who had another job, the time was fairly equally divided in terms of the work that they did via the platform versus not. So the question is, it's a, or the answer is that it's a combination of both, really. Um, in terms of the other question about um, using data for descriptive analysis versus policy and what have been the challenges there. Um, I guess that what has been very interesting about this project, and I wasn't necessarily expecting it up front, is um, how interested and open the uh, company that we've collaborated with has been in both in our collecting the data and, and also very tangibly using the data in ways to try to improve uh, uh, worker experiences. Um, and so there's, if we can discuss the details, it's, it would involve get, getting into a lot of company operations to explain it now. Um, but there are some quite significant changes that they've made over the past year that have been informed in part by the data that we've collected. So that's been very interesting to see. Yeah, thank you for the great questions. Uh, to Riri's question about uh, why are some of the interactions being dropped? So that's essentially um, coming because all of these machine learning models have some sort of feature selection process where they have to drop, you know, they can't use every, so the model is considering every interaction initially. Um, but, and for example, the one I showed you, we've tested different machine learning algorithms. The one I showed you is a random forest where to get quickly into the technical details, you can think of each leaf of each regression tree that makes up that forest as being an interaction with gender, if that was one of the variables it, it used, and the other variables uh, that determined which leafs each observation is on. Um, so they are considering those interactions, but because of the feature selection process, a lot of them end up dropping out, whereas if you're separating the two models, you're basically forcing it. It's always interacting with gender because it's only uh, using the, it's only predicting based on one gender. Um, and then on which variables differentially predict for men and women, we have done that analysis, but I'll have to get back to you because I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, and then the other question on uh, how much does the accuracy increase? Uh, actually, interestingly, we've done this as well for a number of different machine learning models. And we found that as you get to kind of the more complex and more recent developments in the machine learning literature, those models see a larger wedge between how predictive is the pooled model for women versus how predictive is the gender differentiated model for women. So as you get into the more recent and more complex models, you see a bigger gap and a higher increase in the predictive power for women of using the gender differentiated model. Uh, you also asked what happens for men. For them, you see kind of a mirror image where they're below the 45 degree line uh, in the graph I showed. And that's saying, and that's basically an artifact of them benefiting from the current bias against women in uh, when you use a pooled model. Uh, and then finally, to Lucia's point, uh, or overarching question about using admin data and policy experiments. Uh, I'm working on a number of randomized control trials now where we are using administrative data. Um, and then I think uh, to your specific question about descriptive versus policy implementation, I guess one challenge is that for the descriptive analysis or for even evaluating the impact in an RCT, you may need to tell the partner, okay, we need one drop of, you know, we need the data six months after we did the experiment or give it to us once every few months after the experiment, and that's enough for us to uh, do the analysis, whereas for actual policy implementation, if you're trying to have kind of policy adapt uh, 
to these types of uh, gender differentiated data, you may need a more continuous uh, kind of stream of data coming in so that you can adapt uh, policy uh, in response to that. And so that may require kind of a more, uh, more effort going into the infrastructure of how that data is transferred uh, from the partner. Great. So yeah, so to the question on um, um, have we learned anything new? <laughs> Um, I think yes, I, mean, I think obviously um, there is a, a wide literature about anyway, urban mobility or especially mobility and especially cities also being gendered. And some in the room have written about this extensively. I think what was unique about this, thing, this uh, study was indeed that we actually used uh, data that could confirm real behavior as, a, as opposed to describe behavior, right? I mean, typically with surveys, anyway, you get asked a few questions with regard to have you or would you and the like. And so it's more uh, describe behavior than actually actual behavior. And with CDRs, you can actually see actual behavior in almost real time to a certain level of granularity also that is dual location uh, tagged. And so, so that's the, anyway, it was the innovation. We all, the innovation was more in methodology than in finding because indeed, anyway, you could say, well, we knew this all along, but this was actually a, a, a confirmation based upon real behavior as opposed to described uh, behavior. And I think that's the, 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 the real power of big data, certain kinds of big data uh, in this uh, field uh, from my point of view. Um, on the data collaborative side, clearly, I think, um, I think we will have to see more experimentation with different models. And so one big challenge of data collaboratives is indeed, uh, which is the same as the data collaborative that we had here, is that quite, it quite often is a one-off, right? Which comes to your, anyway, your last interventions in order to really see the, um, the, the value of data over time and start to measure, for instance, uh, impact of certain kinds of interventions, such as you install lightning at certain kinds of public transportation bus stops, uh, or you, uh, um, you provide for um, um, new lines of transportation to hospitals, for instance, if that turns out to be the high frequency stops, what does that mean with regard to urban mobility for women? Um, that's where the real value resides, but unfortunately, most of those data collaboratives, which is what we perhaps can talk about in the next panel, uh, are not systematic, right? So they are one-offs, they stop at prototyping, they're always pilots, and as a result, we really have to get out of that pilotization in order to really extract the, the value and do more project experimentation. We should do experimentation non-stop <laughs> uh, in order to really deal with, uh, 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 the, if we see that there is a difference, we see there is a challenge, why don't we non-stop uh, build an infrastructure for non-stop experimentation so that we can see what works, what does not work, and be agile in how we actually go about addressing the problem. But that requires cultural change, it requires a data infrastructure, and we're not there yet. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we are just about at time. So please join me in thanking the panelists.